Hello and welcome to the Talking Trees podcast by Climbing Arborist. So this podcast is going to be a little bit of a different one than all the rest of them so far because today I'm going to do this one solo um, and the reason being is because I went and I've given a couple of presentations on a topic that I really feel strongly about. Um, I've given a couple of presentations over the last few months and the topic has been um, using two hands and two time points while using a chainsaw in the tree and this topic um, it gets to the, I don't know it on on the internet and among you know circles of arborists and within companies it gets talked about a lot and it gets and there's there's always arguments for and against um, you know people that people that use a saw one-handed be it uh, all the time or you know half the time or even just for certain situations the people can be very adamant that that is the way to do it they've never hurt themselves so they're going to keep on doing it and they're not going to change and it's I, I feel like it's one aspect of our industry where people almost get to a point and they stop they stop learning and they stop teaching themselves and they stop willing to progress their climbing abilities and so they feel they feel like they've kind of got to a point and they haven't hurt themselves and this must be the quickest way to do it because they've maybe tried it once or twice the other way or they they work that way a certain amount of the time and it always feels slower uh, you know, they may feel pressure from, you know, other people on the crew or from their bosses. And they always, well, some people resort back to one hand in and no matter how many kind of talks they go to, no matter how many people they speak to, um, you know, no matter how many training seminars they go to, they're it's going to be very hard to change their mind. And, you know, one of the reasons is if you haven't, if no, if you haven't cut yourself before, even if you have cut yourself before, you always have the mindset that it'll, you'll never cut yourself. You don't, nobody goes to work thinking, right, today I'm probably going to cut myself. Like if, if you, if that's the way you're thinking, then you should, well, for starters, you should be finding a different career um, or you should be drastically changing the way that you work because if you're actually thinking that, there's something wrong. But so the majority of people don't think that and, you know, that's so. So if you don't think you're going to cut yourself, then why would you why would you change? But the way I see, I mean, Safe work practices have evolved over time. Health and safety evolves over time because of statistics within whatever industry they're looking at. Um, within our industry, the safe work practices have evolved over time to say you shouldn't use a chainsaw one-handed because there have been so many incidents where an arborist has cut them themselves due to one hand and a chainsaw um the same goes for using a second um point of attachment so uh, what what i mean by that is using your lanyard as a second time point while making a cut um, which prevents you know if if you cut your main rope or you cut your lanyard you're still attached by another time point so you're not going to fall and have a major injury or you're not going to fall to your death or you know that kind of thing um so the the, those safe work practices are put there for a reason and it's one of those things that people seem very reluctant to do and it when i do my presentations i always try and i always try and make it kind of 
so that the audience participates quite a lot so I hear from them why they do what they do uh, hear if they've got any stories I want to hear you know in what scenario do you use the chainsaw one-handed why you feel it's necessary um, and then I you know I try and kind of come up with solutions and obviously in my head I'm coming up with uh, with solutions but I pretty much get the same few answers every single time that some some answers throw a curveball and some answers are absolutely ridiculous and so ridiculous I've never heard them before um but you know I, I hear the same answers over and over again and it it pretty much always comes down to speed that that is the main reason um so a couple of examples so if I ask people why they feel like they have to use a chainsaw one-handed maybe they maybe they don't use a saw one-handed all of the time maybe it's just you know now and again but what are the reasons when you do it so uh, common examples would be uh, cutting and holding so there's there's something below that you don't want to damage um, or you may be the trees overhanging somebody else's garden and you need to get it back in the property that you're working for so it's easier for the groundsman to remove all the debris. Um, there's, a, there's a bunch of reasons why you would cut and hold. So people say, yeah, cut and hold. So that basically they're using their chainsaw with the right hand and holding the limb with the left hand. Now this, if you just kind of step back and, and don't think about anything else, on the job site you just think about that one scenario you're you're cutting a branch with a chainsaw using only your right hand and you're using your left hand to hold the branch that you're cutting so that it doesn't fall to the ground instantly if if you kind of if you take a step back away from thinking about being on a job and you just think of that one specific scenario automatically that kind of that makes you think yeah there, there's there's definitely a safer way to do this um, because you're putting your left hand in harm's way yeah you might have two feet between the saw and the hand uh, you might have even more you might like depending on how big you are how big your arm span is um, you know the angle of the branch all these kind of things but you've put your left hand somewhere where there is a chance that the saw can you know skip along the branch it can you can kind of lose control if it goes through the branch quicker than you thought if there are uh, if there's a like a like a hard knot in the branch and so you put extra force that you didn't think you needed to and then once it goes through you're pushing a lot harder like there's there's so many so many little things that you don't ever think about if you if you're using a, a saw one-handed you just think i'm making a simple cut my hands out of the way how can i cut myself but there are so many small um small you know un, small chances or things that aren't very common but that do happen and it's one of those it only takes one of those um, that kind of comes out the blue, takes you by surprise to catch you out. And, you know, some people have cut themselves with a chainsaw and they get lucky. It's just a, like a little, a little nick, but some people only do it once and, you know, they lose their hand or they sever some major tendons, arteries, that kind of thing. So, you know, you never... You never want that to happen at all, but by using a saw one-handed, you, you're, you're, there's, there's a higher risk. So, what do we need to do as arborists? We need to mitigate the risk, and to mitigate that risk, it's pretty simple. You pull your left hand and put it on the saw. So, if you've got your right hand and your left hand on the saw, one, the saw is, is in much more, con you're, you're in much more control of the saw. Two, your left hand isn't now exposed, isn't vulnerable, isn't a target for the saw. Um, so it automatically becomes, you know, you've reduced that risk almost 
to a zero risk of cutting your, well, definitely cutting your hand with a chainsaw. Like you're not from that position. There's, a, there's, I, I don't know what would have to happen for you to cut your arm or your hand from having both hands securely on the saw with your, you know, a, a good grip with your thumbs are wrapped around the handles. I don't, I don't see how you would cut yourself in that point so you've eliminated you've eliminated all risk so you've gone from you know there being a you might want to say just a one percent risk or you might want to say a point five percent risk of cutting your hand but why why do we want any risk of cutting our hand when it could end in loss of hand loss of movement in hand loss of arm uh chance of bleeding out chance that you're working with a groundsman who has no climbing capabilities whatsoever. Um, they, there's so many different scenarios that could happen if you cut yourself that they don't even bear thinking about. So, um, so my example was cut and hold. So what are the what are the options? If you if you think well, you know what? How else am I going to do it? There are so many different options for to cutting and holding. One. You could make a little notch cut, face cut, pie cut, whatever you call it. You could make a little one with your chainsaw, depending on the size of the branch or depending on the size of the top. And if you're if you're really adamant that you want to hold it because it's quicker, because you haven't got any rigging gear set up, because it's only one branch that needs cutting and holding, then do the face cut with a chainsaw, but then finish the back cut with the handsaw. So at least, you know, you've got your left hand that you can use with, while using the, saw, the hand saw with the right hand. Obviously, there's still a risk of cutting your hand there because as I well know from a previous cut in the past with a silky, silkies do not take any prisoners. Um, so you, ne- you, need to, you still need to keep your hand well, well, well away from the cutting zone, especially you don't, you don't want it in an area where it can kind of the saw can follow through once it's made the cut and hit you on the hand. But if you're cutting and holding, um, there's kind of a very, you know, a very slim chance of that happening. And if it does happen, yeah, it can, it can be nasty. So we have to still pay attention. But if you're adamant that you need to cut and hold this, that is the safest way to do it. Um, either use a handsaw for the whole cut for like making a step cut or making a, uh, side face cut or you do the face cut with a chainsaw and then you finish the back cut with a handsaw other other ways you can do it um, if the you're worried about dropping a branch on, on like on a piece of property or in a different garden or something that you're trying to avoid then why not you know have you got light rigging gear set up for branches if you're not removing the tree or you know um, you could do some kind of simple speed line. So, you know, you've set a rigging line and you're just sliding branches down. So the, there's not really, there's not really much there for you to do to rig uh, aside from clip on a sling, clip it to a rope, get the groundsman to hold the, bra- to hold the rope out and slide it down. The, you know, once you've, I think a lot of people find that setting rigging gear up, oh, it's so time consuming. I only need to rig a few branches or, but once you have a rigging system set up and if you plan that from the very beginning, it, it isn't taking that much longer. Yeah. You've got to, you know, get the, the rigging point high in the tree, um, or the, the slide line system high in the tree. But, if you're if you're taking off multiple branches, it's definitely worth it. Um, you know, then you can get the branches exactly where the groundsman wants them, or you know that's much more favourable. So it's actually saving time on the ground. Maybe taking a little bit longer due to setup in the tree, but it's saving time on the ground. So there's plenty of options for rigging, um, handsaw use, that kind of thing. Uh, right, another reason why people decide to use a saw one-handed is some people feel like they need to hold on to the tree. Uh, they feel like, or, or hold on to their own climbing rope. 
And the only reason for this is that you're trying to balance yourself. So you you're not you don't feel like you're well balanced on the limb that you're standing on to do or make the cut that you want to make. So you you then go ahead and and grab on to your rope or to another tree branch with your left hand. Now, this is a pretty simple one. If that's the way you're climbing, then you can drastically improve your climbing. You have a lanyard, which a lot of people don't don't think of this way, but the lanyard should be thought of as a work positioning tool, not just this inconvenience of a second time point. The lanyard, the lanyard is there, you know, to to assist you and to make your climbing better, to to get you in a better better position, um, to make it easier for you, to put you in more control of the chainsaw. Like if you're if you're having to hold onto the tree or hold onto the rope, that means that you're not stable. And how much more stable are you going to be by holding on? That's it's hard to tell, but. I imagine a lot less stable than if you had a good work positioning system using your lanyard and your main rope. Because using your lanyard you can you can tie on to you know, there'll be there'll be many options where you can tie on to. So you can choose a good point that gives you a really good triangulation between your two different ropes and it means that you can lean back and you know, lean back against the angle of your ropes and it puts you in a solid position. From there, as long as you can have your foot in a little stub, in a, in a u- branch union, uh, something like that, so at least you've got one foot that can kind of help you balance, push away, push against your two time points, then you've got a really stable position, which means that you can then use a chainsaw with two hands. Um, going back to thinking of using the saw with one hand while holding on to your rope or an, a branch for stability with another hand and then you know leaning out to make the cut it's it, it just seems it seems like what it is to me I think that seems it's just laziness really um, and the reason I say that is because you you're not in as comfortable position as you could be. I, maybe it's laziness. Uh, it certainly could be inexperience, um, because inex, inexperience really comes in to a lot of this. And you know, uh, depend it depends on who you've been trained by. Also, so I, yeah, I, I should kind of back up a little bit, really, um, because. You know, I'm taught, I'm just I'm just kind of freestyling a little bit doing this podcast, and I automatically kind of start thinking of people that have been in the industry for a while doing this, and you know, even more experienced people doing this. But I have to go back to to when I first started out, really, and and to think wh- who I was working with because that determines your your climbing style. That determines what you think is good and bad. What you get you know, push to do in certain situations, um, your boss or, you know, your lead foreman or, you know, lead crew member, um, they're the ones that really are going to be a huge influence you influence on you at first because, you know, you might, you may have been to college, you may have done a short course, you may have, you know, done some kind of schooling, but it's, it's been at work for that first kind of year that really kind of sets the tone of how you're going to climb because I don't think there's many people out there that are going to be strong enough mentally to say, hang on, that that's not right. I shouldn't be doing that. I was taught different. Um, I think the majority of people are going to go out and go out into the workplace, see the, the, the lead climber, you know, doing what he does, doing his thing and maybe using some bad habits and thinking, oh, well, that's how that's how you must do it in the workplace, even though I, I was taught different in my chainsaw course or chainsaw class or whatever. Um, so it, for, for rookie climbers, sometimes they don't have 
they don't have that knowledge to call upon or they don't know what's what's kind of right or wrong or bad habits and good habits um so so th- this is uh, this is why I want to do this podcast as well it's for it's for every people of all people of all levels all experience levels um and if you know if I can change a couple of minds by making this podcast then you know I'm happy cuz when I go out and do these presentations what I found was um, I, was, I actually gave one in Idaho recently, and this is this is why I'm doing this podcast because I did I did the presentation. Um, I found out about ten minutes before the presentation that I was the hour that I had was then getting cut to forty five minutes. So instantly I was kind of almost rushing to give my presentation and explain my points and that kind of thing. And that, and so afterwards, you know, I was still. I was still happy with how it went, but I still had more information to give, and I wanted, you know, you know, maybe ask, a, have a people, have people ask a couple more questions, but I didn't get that chance. And even if I have had that that chance of the full hour, I still still not long enough really to to get through the points that I want to get. Um, and so yeah, so that's why I'm doing this podcast because I really. I was sat on the plane on the way home and I was just, there were so many things that frustrated me because there were so many guys there that were, you know, when I go and do these podcasts, I ask the question, how many people use a saw one-handed? How many people use one time point? And a lot of people, I, I, I find that a lot of people are willing to admit that they do it and some people, um, some people admit it but are wanting to change or wanting me to give them the ideas and techniques of how to go about it differently or or they want me to give them some piece of of advice that's going to change their mind to how they work at the moment some people completely are just there to get the CEUs and they uh, i think it would be one of their um, crew members cutting off their arm that would it would take to change their mind kind of thing um seeing something horrific like that so yeah, like if I can go in there and change just one person's habits or even like I, I tend to kind of challenge people at the end of the presentation to say, look, just give it give it a month and try and make a change because it's, you know, it's not going to like it's not going to happen overnight. You're not going to instantly be able to be able to do this and and think it's going to going to get it's going to be easy straight away you know it's going to be slower straight away um but i'll get on to i'll get on to kind of changing your habits in a little bit i'll just i'll just i'll just rewind i'm kind of jumping all over the place so hopefully you can kind of stay with me and and you're not like what what is he talking about he's talking absolute nonsense um so yeah let me go back to uh, a few more examples of why people decide to use the chainsaw one-handed so you know i was saying holding onto the tree to balance um and the next one the next one is the most ridiculous one i think i've ever seen and you know i let me just say like what i should have said this at the very beginning i have one-handed a saw on many occasions early on in my career um i was never I was never taught or I never worked with anybody that that told me to do it all the time, that said, yeah, that's fine to do it all the time. I, like, I, I went through college. I went through the um, UK chainsaw programs to get your certification. So I knew, I knew the correct procedure to use a chainsaw, you know, two hands with two time points. And I knew that. So I wasn't going in there completely blind. Um, but I have certainly used a chainsaw on many occasions because my, my the people that I worked for they they said oh yeah you know if you can't reach a branch or you know if you need a hand to stabilize yourself or it's not safe or whatever and so there you know there was always the option to do it and what I find now is that if you get given the option if 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 there's an exception to the rule, 
people will just take that exception and stretch it and stretch it and stretch it until it becomes the norm and until it fits into their everyday climbing. Um, so that was bad, but you know, I'm still quite happy that I never used a saw one handed all of the time. Anyway, um, yeah, so I'm definitely not, you know, whiter than white. I have used a chainsaw one handed many times in the past, but about four or five years ago, I, I really made a commitment to myself and decided not, not to use the saw one handed like anymore. I just thought, you know, what, what is the point? Um, and all it came down to with me is it was just, it was just laziness. It was like, oh, I've got this one branch to take off. Do I really, can I really be bothered to put my lanyard on, which is going to take another five seconds for this one branch, for this one bit of dead wood, uh, etc., etc. And what I, what I realized is that you need some kind of motivation to do it. You need the motivation to to guilt yourself because I decided to do the do this of my own accord. What I think would be absolutely awesome, and for people listening, I think this is the this is the way to do it. If you work for a company, and you work, you know, on a on a team, maybe it's the same team every day. Maybe you you switch round crews every day. Get everybody together. Get get your whole crew together and say, you know, see if everybody's going to be on board. Say right let's work safer we don't want we don't want accidents in this company i don't want to be rescuing you out of a tree you don't want to be rescuing me out of a tree um i don't want to see you know a a mashed up hand forearm leg that kind of stuff because yeah nobody nobody wants to see that nobody wants to be put in a position where they have to rescue somebody or they have to be rescued so let's get together let's let's make a pact now we're all gonna use a chainsaw with two hands, two time points, no exceptions. And what we wanna do is keep each each and everybody accountable. And as soon as as soon as you have other people keeping you accountable, you that that's already is in your head when when you go to make a cut with one time point, you're like, oh god, somebody might see me doing this and I don't wanna be the one person you know, who gets pointed out in front of everybody else. Um, and I really think you, you need some kind of motivation. So being kept accountable is motivation because you don't want to be seen to be the one person, you know, in among your your group of climbers that's, um, that's kind of taking shortcuts. Uh, oh, I just, hang on a second. I'm just going to have to put the power in my computer it's about to run out okay what an absolutely amateur podcasting mistake to make uh so i apologize for that um where was i so uh where was i where was i oh yeah so so keeping each other accountable um i think that is i think that is a, a huge motivation and a help to keep to start you on the right path and it, it, if if you have a group of you that are really are really into it and you know really want to really want to progress and up your game and continue to be the best then you know pitch it to them and if everybody's on the same page awesome um the other the other thing like motivation can be a bunch of stuff especially if you have a family if you if you have kids man that that's all the motivation you need. Like, do you? Why would you ever need any other motivation? If you have kids, I don't. I I just can't understand why you would want to use a saw one-handed if there's going to be a chance that you could seriously injure yourself. Could affect. Could affect the rest of your life. Um, enjoying your life with the, your kids. You know, if you can't move one hand, if you lose a hand, if you. You know, if it causes serious injury. Um, on top of that, you've got, you know, lo- like being off work. So if you if you if you do a serious damage to yourself and you're off work for months, how is you, how are your your family gonna survive? Are they um, are they gonna cope? Does your does your wife girlfriend 
have a job and does she earn good money does she earn enough money to support you and your children um do you have disability insurance that kind of thing do you have um workers compensation um you know then depending on how old you are and what other family you're going to affect like brothers and sisters uh, your mum, your dad, like think how everybody's gonna feel. Who is somebody gonna have to take care of you? If you, like, if you do some serious damage, if you cut cut your rope and tie it in once, and you fall out of a tree and do yourself like paralyze yourself, or you know break two legs, or you know who who's gonna look after you? Who is there in your life that doesn't have to be at work every single day, earning money that could look after you? It, it's just it's crazy if there's even a remote slight possibility that that could happen if you injure yourself or that that there's a slight chance that you could injure yourself you like seriously by cutting your hand cutting your leg falling out of a tree man why would you not want to why would you not want to mitigate that risk for what an extra couple of seconds so, yeah, um, this, this, uh, you might be able to tell this topic really, really is one that I'm passionate about. And every time I talk about it, I get like, I really, I apologize if I'm, I don't know if I'm coming, I might be coming across like I'm on my high horse and I'm preaching and I'm telling you do this, do that. Like that's not, that's not where I'm coming from. Um, like I w- all I want is for the industry to, you know, we don't we don't want to be on social media and read every week or every month about somebody falling out of a tree, somebody cutting themselves, somebody dying within the industry because, you know, of of whatever reason. If we can mitigate those risks, you know, like nobody wants to read that stuff. Um, you, it, this might not hit home if you haven't known anybody close to you to cut themselves or to fall or, um, or you know, because if you read about it, you think, oh, that's sad, and you know, they must have. A lot of times, you you might think, oh, they must have been doing something wrong. Um, but it's it's horrible, man. It's horrible to read, and it, it it's sad. Like it's it's really sad that our industry is one of the highest um, has the highest one of the highest incident rates of all industries. Um, and you'll, I mean, if you have to get insurance for like work workers comp, you'll know that by the the premiums that you have to pay. It's absolutely crazy. So, you know, please forgive me if I'm coming across like a I don't know like like I'm preaching and. You know, you might think, who are you to preach? Why am I even listening to this guy talk a load of crap about being safe at work? Like, why doesn't he just look after himself and forget about everybody else and just get on with his own life? Um, and, I mean, I would say to that, like, I I feel like I have, I have a lot of experience in the industry and I have something that I want to share. And, you know, in this day and age with the internet, social media, YouTube, websites, all that kind of stuff. Everybody has a platform to share stuff. And if you have something that you feel like you have, you know, is worth sharing and is going to, could potentially help others, then why not do it? And, you know, why, why be selfish and keep it to yourself? Um, so that's, that's why I do it. I just feel like there's so many incidents within our industry like we need something needs to change and yeah you could say well you know we work in trees and you know we work at height we work with chainsaws these are all things that add risk to a job like you know the like the majority of the world doesn't go to work and use a chainsaw climb trees and so are off the ground by you know 50 60 70 foot however 
high that you, the tree that you're working is. So we've got height, we've got trees. We, then we've got, you know, if you're a groundsman, you've got people working above you, dropping things. Um, so your communication needs to be clear. You, you know, then we've got equipment. There's so much equipment that we, we rely on, like life support equipment. We have harnesses, we have ropes, we have hitch cord, we have carabiners, we have different hardware. We... We have to trust all this equipment. We have to inspect all this equipment. And if any one piece of this puzzle goes wrong, if we use our chainsaw incorrectly, if the chainsaw, you know, if if the chainsaw gets squeezed in between a cut as it closes and reacts completely abnormally um, and catches you by surprise, if... You know, if you if your lanyard is round the back of a of a of a stem that you're piecing down and it's caught over a a little stub and you don't realise it goes it's going in the line of where you're cutting. You know, there's there's so many things, so many potential risks that we need to mitigate. There's, uh, if your carabiners are not working correctly and are sticking open, um, there's a you know there's a chance of a fall as a chance of it coming coming open slip slipping out um there's there's so many things that we have to contend with so i understand that our industry is gonna there's gonna be more incidents than somebody working in an office but a lot of these incidents can be prevented um you know it's it's risk mitigation and it's you know self-preservation that's what it that's what it comes down to it's self-preservation and so many people go through life just you know cruising along and i feel like that's that that's very dangerous in our job the once especially once you get to a certain level of experience as a tree climber like you know five four five six years in I, I feel like that's when you start to kind of get comfy. You get you get comfortable, you get complacent. And complacency, God, that is that is the worst thing that could creep in when you're a tree climber, complacency. Um bad for you, bad for your groundsmen, bad for your employees. That's yeah, absolutely you know, it's dangerous. Um, so we always have to be striving to become better. And I feel like after you've, after you've reached a certain level of skill as a tree climber, I think that's when people start to feel like, oh, I can't, you know, I can't get any better anymore. I'm, you know, they're not seeing improvement in themselves. They think that that's it. They've peaked and they plateau and they're happy with that because they can go to work, prune a tree in a good amount of time or rem take a tree down in a right amount of time. You know, they feel like they have lots of rigging skills, lots of climbing skills. Um, but there's always progression within your, your climbing. Um, and this, so this is where, this is where um, this talk comes in really. And the, the point of work positioning comes in and the point the talk yeah the the point of tying in twice comes in because when i made when i decided to make the switch like well not it's not really a switch because like i said before i wasn't using a chainsaw one handed like every day every cut that kind of thing uh, i used to use it now and again i used to do one tying point uh, I probably, well, I definitely did one tying point more than I did one hand in a saw. Um, and for those people, for those people who are on my side, of, my side of things, like they, they feel like you, you should two hand, you should have two time points. If, if there are, if their counter argument to, to you saying it's slower is, if they say no, it's not. Then I I would I disagree with that, but I disagree at first when you first make 
the change because when I made the change going from you know a single time point um, to, to two time points every single cut I made it really felt slower it, it almost became quite frustrating because some some branches I would get to and be like oh man you know I just got that one branch but that that kind of motivation creeped in for me and my motivation to 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 do everything correctly was basically have by having the website climbingarbus.com because I thought I can't I can't be preaching and and be a hypocrite and doing something what I'm telling people not to do so I that was my biggest motivator um and like I say to you, the, just find something that really gets you going, you know, family, friends, colleagues, that kind of stuff. But yeah, mine was my website. So I had, I had a huge motivation. Even when, even when nobody was watching, I, I find a way to guilt myself to be like, man, if, if you, if you do this cut with one time point now, then you know, you're a hypocrite. So I, I could guilt myself every time I was about to do it, I would guilt myself. And, you know, that first, that first few weeks, that first month of making that decision to not do it anymore was tough, man. It, it, it definitely was tough. It, for anybody who says, you know, it's not slower, that first month, it was hard. It was like, everything just, it was so frustrating to put that second time point on at, at those certain branches that you felt like wasn't really necessary. And now, yeah, it, so it did feel like it slowed me down. I mean, on the whole, I was, I was already the type of climber that would tie in twice and would use two hands the majority of the time. But there were certain occasions where doing that second time point, you know, I thought, oh, just this one bit of dead wood, you know, won't matter. And it was mate, it was those small adjustments that really, that were really hard to, to get over. But what I found was after about, after about a month or six weeks of doing it, um, I found myself like I, ch I completely changed as a climber. Like I, I felt like, you know, I'd plateaued as a climber. I, I was just, I don't know, like 10 years in as a climber, had lots of experience. I'd done lots of different tree jobs, um, you know, a, a huge, a huge range of tree jobs, crane jobs, um, technical rigging jobs, um, being from the UK, I did a lot of crown reductions, um, like full canopy reduction pruning. I used to do that a lot. Um, I, I've pretty much done all different types of tree job apart from I've never worked with a helicopter. Um, you know, that is that is one that's on the bucket list, but it seems like unless you live in New Zealand, <laughs> you don't get the chance to to remove a tree with the aid of a helicopter. So um, I don't, I don't foresee that ever happening, but yeah, aside from that, I've done, I've done most jobs. Um, and I've also lost my train of thought. <laughs> uh, God, what, what was I saying? What was I saying? Oh yeah, so I, you know, I felt like I'd plateaued um, I felt like my my climbing I felt like it, you know it wasn't going to get much better than it was at that point and I I didn't see in what areas I could really advance maybe maybe the only way it was going to improve was to become fitter become stronger become more agile flexible or something like that but it wasn't maybe it wasn't in the skill um it was more in the physical sense of fitness uh, until I made this change. And then I made this change and I'm like, oh, like there, I kind of, it's almost like I went back five years of experience because it did, it did feel like I'd slow down. And what I realized after, so after the six week point of making this change and like 
guilty myself every time I went to to use the saw one handed was I th- I realised that I was I changed the way in which I climbed because I was rather than just looking at each branch that I was about to prune, figuring out where to tie on, um, what position I was going to get myself in, like what body position. I was then I I went from that to planning like planning ahead. Obviously, we you know a lot of tree guys. Well, every tree guy, I imagine, makes some kind of a plan before they even enter the tree. I'm not talking that kind of plan, although that, I mean, that is hugely important. You need to know how you're going to address the tree before you even get in there. You need to know so you can relay the information to your groundsman. You have like a a, a rescue plan. You have a plan of how things are going to go. But, you know, things change when you're in the canopy. Um, you know, lots of things change. Anyway, I'm so that's one kind of a plan. But what I mean is, once you're in the canopy, and you're you're kind of moving around, moving to one area where you're doing some pruning, looking at what you're pruning or what branches you're taking off if you're doing a removal, and thinking, right, if I tie in here, I'm going to give myself uh, an excellent work position. I'm going to be able to reach you know, four, five, six, seven, eight limbs from one um, time point with my lanyard. So what I mean by that is you're already, you're already tied in with your main line. So I'm, I'm looking ahead and I'm thinking where is going to be the optimal or optimum position to put my lanyard. And I realized I was doing this after, you know, a month to six weeks. And then the, my efficiency just went off the charts like I went from being an efficient climber before I made the switch to then seeming to go back five years and slowing down and then you know once I really stuck with it after this this certain point this six week point I've yeah my efficiency just skyrocketed back up and and now I feel like I actually feel like, well, I, for one, I feel like I'm a much better climber because I'm I'm as safe as I possibly can be. Um, so I'm way safer than I was before. Meaning, I wasn't, I didn't, I didn't feel like I was unsafe before. I didn't think I was doing anything stupid. But now I've mitigated those few risks on those few occasions. I, I've mitigated them. They're they're not there anymore because I'm I'm doing everything by you know safe work practices safe work standards and i figured out a way how to be as efficient you know i i look i plan ahead i plan seven eight nine limbs ahead um i then you I, I use different techniques to get you know the most optimum work position possible i i use different lanyard configurations um one of my favorites is using the like the small prusik loop that come if you know what a ce lanyard is it's made by you know tuffelberger um it was kind of an idea that came out of the tree imagineers and so you say you have a 15 foot lanyard you have a small prusik that's on your that's on your lanyard you pass the the end of your lanyard around with that has the carabiner on and and rather than connecting your carabiner back to your harness like to your side D's, you connect the carabiner to the small prusik so it's going around the stem or around a large limb wherever you're choosing to tie onto but it's not choking it's not choking like the carabiner against the stem it's 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 clipping onto the prusik that doesn't move um so you're creating like a single, you creating like a single line, um, basically. And so going from, so you have, say you have a 15 foot lanyard. So you've got a probably, probably a, a usable. If you have it in a in a in a regular configuration, you you can probably get seven feet away from your time point, uh, depending on the size of the branch and that kind of stuff. Using this single line configuration on your lanyard, you know, depending on the the diameter circumference of the 
of the branch or the stem, you can you can probably get 13 feet away. So you're you're doubling the the distance that you can get away from that time point. Um, and and doing that you doing that kind of technique, using that kind of technique is uh, such a useful trick if you're trying to improve efficiency. Um, depend I mean depending on the situation, like every every situation is different. So all these techniques have the time and the place, the you know, to use them. Um, but if you if you're aware of all the different techniques that you can use, like there's going to be a time and a place that it's going to come in handy, and you're going to be you're going to be thankful that you knew um, the technique at the time. So. You know, so there's so many different configurations. Um, when it comes to when it comes to work positioning, uh, I almost exclusively use the lower D rings on on the tree motion harness because you know the 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 lower D rings are basically connected. They're exactly the same um, connection points as the bridge. They're they're pulling on you on the hips and on the legs that so they're kind of sharing the load so connecting to your lower d's you're sharing that load and you can be suspended from the lower d's whereas if you use side d's on whether it be on a tree motion or on any other harness your it's pulling on your on your back on your lower back on your hips um, and you shouldn't really ever be suspended by the side D's. It's not. It's not designed as a suspension point. It's designed basically just to lean backwards with the lanyard in a, um, a horizontal position. So, like if you're blocking down a stem, that's kind of what what they're there for. So, if you're using your side D's for work positioning, um, you're often you're often going to be put into a like an uncomfortable position um and as well uh, to add to that like the side d's on the tree motion mean that you have you have way more range of motion than you would uh sorry on the, yeah the lower d's um so you have much more range of motion on the lower d's than you would on the side d rings um so if you if you have a harness that is that only has side D rings. I would really encourage you um, to try and use the the center ring or cent or the bridge quite more often for your work positioning. Um, it can. And I know it, it does get annoying because you have your lanyard kind of trailing between your feet, so you never want to you never want to leave your lanyard there in between you know pruning branches. So you don't want to you don't want to be climbing around the canopy with your lanyard on your center D. Um, which is why those those side D rings, those lower D rings, uh, you know, I, I I can't understand why all harnesses don't have the lower D rings. It's just it's a for me it's a must. Like you can leave your lanyard there, you can climb around with it there, um, and it just is so much more comfortable and it gives you a much better work position. So. Yeah, it's, it's choosing the it's choosing the right configuration in the right situation to get the best work positioning for you, um, and that that's how we become more efficient. So, like I was saying, I, I realized I was planning ahead much more than I used to, which may has made me a, a much safer, better climber than I ever was before when I didn't feel like there was any more progress to be made. Um, and the, for those, so I'm, I'll tell you a little story for those who, who say that it's much slower to, I'm just going to have a quick sip of coffee here. My, um, mouth's getting a little dry. Sorry, quick sip of water as well. Um, yeah, I'll, so I'll tell you a, um, a quick story. So I work. You know, I've worked for. I live in Canada now. I worked for a couple of companies around around uh, the city, and worked with many, many people. Really, some really good arborists. Um, you know, 
some some excellent guys and then I I started contracting um, and I, I did this one job and you know if you if you watch if you follow me on YouTube or watch some of the climbing arborist videos you may have seen one that I posted probably a few months ago now it was um, it was a really interesting job that um, a friend and I did and it was out in eastern BC and it was like um, it was like a wildlife habitat project um, and I'm sure he won't mind me dropping his name because uh, I'm gonna really give him props for this um, but so I, the the guy I was working with is a, is a friend of mine called Ryan Murphy who lives on Vancouver Island here in BC uh, and it was just myself and Ryan that were the climbers on the job and and what the the job was is we went out to uh, eastern BC and I can't remember who I can't remember who was funding it some the like wildlife or environmental um, uh, federation or something out something out in the Kootenays anyway and they were trying to create a habitat for certain birds that were I don't think they were endangered but numbers were numbers were dropping lower than than what was comfortable I think so we worked on this project um that had been had been done for I think the previous 6 or 7 years and it was it was to to climb certain trees in certain different locations in the Kootenays and there were what was called there was three different treatments so they were they were called treatments in inverted commas and basically it was to inoculate um to inoculate the tree with a certain disease and that was either to kill the tree completely it was to kill the top of a tree but leave the lower canopy live or it was to um it was to uh, introduce a decay in a tree, but hopefully it wouldn't kill the tree, but it would just decay in a certain part of the main stem so that the tree was still alive. Because for, for all these different so-called treatments, it would attract different birds to um, use it for habitat. Anyway... Uh, I'm rabbiting on here, <laughs> absolutely talking crap. So that was the that was the uh, that was the job description, and it was the first time that I got to work with Ryan because Ryan lives on Vancouver Island. I live in Vancouver, so you know it's not the same place, um, and we'd never worked for the same company or anything. Uh, but I'd I'd met Ryan through the tree climbing competitions. Um, Ryan as a previous champion of bc um you know a few years back uh whenever i saw him climb he was always you know qualifying for the masters uh absolutely awesome climber uh, but what really impressed me and really shocked me is that when we worked on this job never did i once see ryan climb the tree without two points of attachment um when he was making a cut or never saw him one hand a chainsaw and and I was doing the same I at, at this point this was this was this was past the point where I decided to make that change so the 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 project was I think late 2016 uh, it was like October 2016 so you know I'd already made the switch at that point um so I was doing it but I've worked with a lot of guys and even a lot of really experienced guys, a lot of great guys that I've worked with, I know for a fact would have probably at some point not tied in twice for certain cuts and all this kind of stuff. So seeing Ryan and watching the way he climbed and seeing the speed that he could do things was, you know, it just took my breath away. Like I, I felt like I was an efficient climber and man like you know com it's hard not to compare yourself to somebody when you're doing you know very similar work day in day out for i think we were there for three weeks and you know first couple of days 
we would climb and maybe we would do a like a, obviously we would do a different tree but we would maybe do a different treatment on the, the on the tree that we were doing at the same time as each of us so i would i would think oh you know he's he's probably done his quicker because he did a, a different treatment which was quicker um so i'd keep telling myself that and then towards the end of the project i'm like i uh, and you know i'm need to stop kidding myself here ryan is just an absolute beast of a climber and he's so efficient in the way he's so methodical and efficient in the way he does things um so I, having worked with somebody like that who's so good so you know so safe so technically good as an arborist in in everything that they do in work positioning in safety um, if anybody ever tells me now that you can't, it's that that it's slower to be safe, then I'm gonna call bullshit on you. It's I'm gonna call absolute bullshit. If you have ever worked with somebody like Ryan, I mean, if you're lucky enough to work with Ryan, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But if you, there's gonna be there's gonna be other guys out there that are exactly the same. They're so proficient in in their skills in their techniques uh, that they're so safe and if if ever you get a chance to work with somebody like that you know that you're talking shit when you say that you can't be efficient and you can't be quick when you're using a saw two hands two time points uh, like it's it's bullshit so um yeah it, I just thought I, <laughs> I don't know what else. What's my next point going to be? Um, yeah, I just kind of got carried away there for a little bit, but um, yeah, let's go back to work positioning. So, what I think about my th well, my thoughts on work positioning now is the way that we the way that we teach using the lanyard shouldn't be. It shouldn't be taught as your lanyard is there to be used as an as like it shouldn't be seen as an inconvenience to having to use it to tie into make a to make a cut. It should be used. It should be seen to be used as a as a tool to make better work positioning to make to make you more comfortable to have more stability. Um, to be able, to be able to get to places where you you wouldn't otherwise be able to get to, like I. Ha so, I, when I ask the question when I'm doing my talk, um, why people, you know, why people don't use a, a lanyard in certain situations, or like there's some people say, oh, you know, I can't, you know, I I can't get out to where I want to be um, with a lanyard on, it's holding me back or it's pulling me back or the, there's so many, there's so many different reasons and excuses why. But what I, I found, well, for starters, I found in the last five years, I've, you, I've used the, um, the lanyard for every single cut that I've made and there hasn't been a cut that I can't make. So either I'm climbing the wrong trees or I'm climbing in a different way but I haven't found a cut that I haven't been able to make um, you just you figure it out um, and I find using your lanyard actually aids you it assists you if you can select the right time point you can cl you can get further in the canopy than you could without using the second time point you can use it to your advantage you can use it you know, to pull yourself further out, you can use it f so you're way more stable. Um, so you're 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 attached in like um, a V formation, both coming from above you, so you're much more stable. You you can use your lanyard to lean back against, so you're more stable. You can use your lanyard to you can even use your lanyard to pull a a kind of a branch towards you if if the if it's the the right situation for it so yeah i do, uh, i 
I I, th- I feel like um, when we're teaching other other climbers to use to use the lanyard, we shouldn't we shouldn't be focusing on the lanyard is f- is for um, we shouldn't be focusing on the lanyard is for the chainsaw use. We should be focusing on the lanyard being a work positioning tool once a climber gets comfortable in using it as a work positioning tool and figures out that you know in every in every location where you have a work task you can be much more comfortable if you're if you're using your lanyard correctly um you you don't have to wrap your foot around a branch to get the position you want you don't have to you don't have to really tense up your core muscles to to balance and keep yourself stabilized you 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 can use your lanyard so that you can lean against it or it can or you can suspend from it or you can just get yourself in a much better position so you're not fatiguing yourself by tensing all your muscles to stay in one position um so once if we can if we can teach our new climbers that that the the lanyard is a is a tool to be used in a, in a climbing situation and it it's going to make our climbing better it's going to um you know it's going to make us have less fatigue it's going to make the climbing more enjoyable it's going to make a more stable work position it's going to reduce stress on the body uh it's going to improve your climbing skills overall if we can teach that and then introduce a lanyard your 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 new climber's already kind of already learnt that he's using the lanyard even just to to climb around to get in positions. Maybe you've let them use a handsaw and always making them lanyard on so that you know they've got that stable position. So they don't they don't have that worry in the back of their mind: Are they going to swing? Are they going to fall? Which which are you know those are real worries when it comes to the your, the rookie tree climber they're always you know they've got so many things going through the mind oh god am i gonna fall here do i need to hold on for dear life while i make this cut is the branch gonna you know fly back up me uh, like yeah uh, sorry you know flick back up after i've pruned the end off um there's so many things that go through the climber's head especially when they're new we want to make it as comfortable as possible for them we want we want them not to to worry about the thought of falling or the thought of swinging or we don't want them to be focused on tensing up and wrapping a an ankle you know or a leg round a branch or through a fork to stay in one position we want them to be using their lanyard so that they can stay in that position and then focus on making a proper cut and you know controlling where the branch goes or like you know, getting themselves out of harm's way if they're rigging. Those are the things they should be focused on. They shouldn't be focused on, am I going to fall? Am I going to swing? Um, that kind of stuff. So if we can if we can teach the newcomers and then also teach, you know, teach experienced guys if, if they're not lanyard users, the importance of the lanyard and how much more enjoyable it makes the climbing once they get the hang of it and you know if people want to improve their climbing skills then that's a way to improve because i guarantee you if somebody feels like they've they've peaked and they've plateaued and they can't get any better let me tell you there's there's plenty of things that i i bet you could do to improve your climbing and improve maybe doesn't mean be 10 times faster improve maybe means be safer because at that point you're probably already pretty pretty quick at climbing um but if you can if you can be just as quick just as efficient but be much safer then that to me my book that is an improvement and if you like i was talking about my friend earlier ryan if you could become a climber like ryan who could do everything in accordance with safe work practice and be quicker than anybody else i know uh, then you've made it like you are 
creme de la creme of tree climbers. Um, but I don't think there's many of those guys around that work like that and are that efficient. So going back to going back to the speed thing. So if you're still not convinced, if you're not convinced at what I've been talking about and what I've been bloody spouting on about for the last hour, um, it, you know, if you're still if you're still listening, <laughs> that's a good thing, because <laughs> oh god, I am talking. Uh, I don't know where this is all come from. Um, I'm just I'm just talking and talking. But if you're still there, if you're still with me, then I really appreciate it and. And this this is looking good for you because if you're still listening, then it must mean that you know you're interested in what I'm saying. So let's go back to to speed. Speed speed is the thing, isn't it? Speed is what everybody's worried about. And being an arborist, it's a I think it's safe to say it's a very egotistical industry to be in. Um, there's a lot of guys. A lot of people in this industry have large egos and you know everybody has an ego to some extent it's just how how big of an ego how much you can keep your ego in check um why you feel like you have to be the big man the fastest the biggest the best the strongest um so let me just ask ask you a couple of questions how how do you judge speed as a tree climber? Um, and what I find is that most people, they want to, if they want to be the the quickest, the fastest, the speed climber, which you should be, because you know, if you want to be the best, you want to be the quickest. You want to be as long as as long as you the standard of your work is good. You want to be as quick as you possibly can. So that's a good. It's a good thing to aspire to be, but. Is your speed, are you judging your speed, how quick you can prune one branch, move to the next branch, prune a branch, like, are you, is it, are you looking at it quite narrow-minded, or are you looking at speed on the whole as, you know, the entire job, because that's what I see speed as, I see speed as, I want to get this tree down in, you know, the most efficient way possible in obviously the least amount of time as possible but giving my groundsman the most amount of help that I possibly can by doing it in a certain way so if you're raining down branches on your groundsman and you have one groundsman or you have two groundsmen the question is can you do you do your groundsman keep up with the branches as they're coming down and what I would say to that is if you're working with one groundsman let's say you're doing a removal there's no chance that your groundsman is keeping up with the branches that are coming down from that tree because one like unless unless the chipper is right underneath the tree and even then I think even you know yeah even then I think that your groundsman is going to struggle to keep up Okay, so what you're doing when you decide to give your groundsman a chance? All right, yeah, go ahead, clean up. You know, I'll give you five minutes. What are you What are you doing in that five minutes? You're probably sitting there, taking selfies, posting to Instagram. That's what we all seem to do nowadays. Um, but if you think about what you've just done, if you if you have just rained down branches for ten minutes. And then you're going to give your groundsman 10 minutes to clear them. But you were doing that either one-handed or you were doing that one time point or you were doing that with both one hand and one time point. Then how is that How is that quicker? Because you, you then sat around for 10 minutes, right? So if, instead of doing that, if you use two hands, two time points, maybe you, it might be a, a couple of minutes slower. But then in the situation that I'm describing, you're still going to be hanging around for eight to ten minutes. Or sorry, you know, five five to six minutes, or you know, we can we can say whatever numbers we like, but um the point that I'm getting to is 
you might, if you're like tearing around a tree, you might feel like you're really quick. But then if you're sat around because the guys on the ground uh, can't keep up with you, what is the point? Why, why wouldn't you be safer and more efficient? And it's going to, in the end, it's, the job is going to take the exact same amount of time because no matter how quick you are in the tree, if your groundsman can't keep up, then you've got that same amount of like dead time to sit around. So that dead time could be used to actually, you know, perform better in the tree, to be safer in the tree. Um, so, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's one of the biggest points I think about, uh, about my, me putting, putting this across to people is how are you judging speed? Because to me, speed should be judged as a whole, as an entire job. And I think that's how, that's how, that's how arborists and tree companies need to work. We need to work as a team. We need to work as a crew. We we shouldn't be working to boost our own ego to say I'm the fastest tree climber in the West. Um, it's, that's not what it's about. It's about teamwork. Like we work on a team every single day. We work together every single day. Um, this is why things like you know things like having good communication using the Bluetooth headsets makes the job easier makes it quicker makes it more efficient because you're always being able to keep you're always keeping on the same page as your you know your co-workers rather than shouting one word instructions from in a tree and getting frustrated so it naturally speeds up a job naturally makes things more enjoyable you're working as a team you should enjoy working as a team um so then why when it comes to being a quick fast tree climber why is that suddenly become uh like a an individual solo thing it's like it's it's almost like a team sport being an arborist being on a tree crew being part of a tree care company it's it's a team you yeah you might be seen as the I don't I'm not into American football but you might be seen as the quarterback like the star player because you're the climber and the other guys are the groundsmen. But you still need the team around you. You still need guys that know how to work efficiently on the ground. Because at the end of the day, we all want to go home. We want to go home. We want to make the job as easy as possible. As they say, work harder, not... Sorry, work smarter, not harder. We want to make the job as easy as possible. We want to make the job as quick as possible. And that all comes down to teamwork. So, so think the next time, the next time you're climbing after you listen to this, if you're still listening, um, the next time you climb, just pay attention to how much downtime you've got in the tree, how many selfies you're taking in the tree, and and add that time up and think right. Well, actually, I probably add about you know, 15 minutes of downtime during the whole day in that, say you're climbing for three to four hours, you probably had, say, and then say you you had 15 to 20 minutes of downtime while you guys were cleaning up, um, while you're waiting for the rigging line or, you know, anything like that. And then think, actually, if I changed my ways and I made became a safer climber, um made every cut with two two hands on the saw would the job have taken any longer it might have felt a little longer from me from my perspective as an individual because i'm not used to doing that yet it might have taken you know it might have the whole my time in the tree might have taken 10 minutes longer but then you know take that out of the 20 minutes that you were sat around taking selfies and um it's the the whole job hasn't taken any longer whatsoever so yeah so that's it i, I think i might wrap it up now because i've been uh, i've been talking for quite a while 
Uh, and if you know me, I'm not I'm not a big talker, so I don't know how I've managed that. But this is something that I'm, like I said before, I'm extremely passionate about. I really want to help anybody who's willing to take on board the information that I've I've been talking about. Um, I'd love to hear some of your comments. Um, so I don't know either comment on my YouTube video. I'll post the podcast to YouTube. Comment on um, Instagram if I I'll I'll post about the podcast on Instagram. Um, send me an email. My email is mail at climbingalbris.com. Uh, I really want to know what you think about you know what I've been talking about. Um, and I, oh, another thing just before I go. So I really want to. I'm I'm like at the time of recording this, I'm making a new website and it's it's very close to being finished and one of the things that I wanted to add to the new website was to have a page of other people's videos I put a poster out about it quite a long time ago now basically saying send me a link to a video that you've done um, and as long as it complies with all safe work practices I'll be more than happy to put it on my on this new page that I'm creating Man, can I not find a video that doesn't somewhere have a bad practice in there somewhere? Some videos I've watched pretty cool, and then all of a sudden, oh, something happens in the video. Um, you know, I'm like one. I remember one that got sent to me. It was great. Everything was going right. Two time points. Two two hands on the saw. Um, rigging. Everything was good, and then. Even just something small like the they tied a they tied like a bowline for their uh, termination back to their harness, which isn't you know that's not industry best practice. You need like a cinching knot if you're using it as your termination knot. Um, thing just little things like that, like tiny things that people don't think about. But if I'm if I'm going to post videos on my site that are other people's I want them to be kind of it's like me saying I'm a I approve of this video watch this video because you you'll learn something from it it's showing good work work practice um but man I can't I can't find any I've I think two people have sent me videos that I'm I'm gonna post up until now and yeah so if you've got any if you've got any videos that you've made that you think uh, comply with everything safety wise and all pruning or all chainsaw use is good then please please send me a link because i really want to feature as many videos as i can but i don't want to feature anything that that i don't approve of um anyway i really appreciate you listening to this thanks a lot i hope that you can take something away from this podcast um if you if you haven't done so by now uh, please Press the subscribe button on iTunes if that's where you get the podcast from. Um, if you if you're watching this on YouTube, please press the subscribe button and the the little there's a little bell that means that you get a notification every time I post a video. Um, click that as well, then you'll get notified every time I post something new. Um, and yeah, keep your eyes open for the new website being launched. Uh, I'm really excited about it. Got a bunch of new stuff on there. Um, easier easier to navigate mobile friendly better images better looking site um it's about time because the other one's feeling a little dated so thanks again for listening much appreciate it stay safe everybody um for now i'm out thanks a lot see ya bye